Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you've decided to join us. We are doing a series on the book of Galatians, and this is lesson number six. We'll be covering especially Galatians 3, 15 to 20, and we would encourage you to open your Bibles to that passage. You'll see some variation with the different versions. Uh, I will be using primarily the Good News Bible by the American Bible Society. This lesson is entitled, The Priority of the Promise, and I hope you'll understand what that means by the time we get to the end. This lesson is for study on November 5 of 2011. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, we're so thankful for the scriptures that you have provided us, for the words to teach us about you from Genesis to Revelation now as we turn to this particular passage in Galatians, may we understand you better as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson will focus on the relationship between faith and obedience to the law as described in Galatians 3, 15 to 20. I'm going to begin simply by asking you to look at your Bible. I'll read from mine and we'll see what the different scriptures say here um, and, and, and just compare them. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to use an everyday example. When two people agree on a matter and sign an agreement, no one can break it or add anything to it. Now God made his promises to Abraham and to his descendant. The scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people, but the singular descendant, meaning only one person, namely Christ. And of course, the word Christ is the Greek for the Hebrew word Messiah. What I mean is that God made a covenant with Abraham and promised to keep it. The law, which was given 430 years later, cannot break that covenant and cancel God's promise. For if God's gift depends on the law, then it no longer depends on his promise. However, it was because of his promise that God gave that gift to Abraham. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is. <clears throat> and it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant, to whom the promise was made. The law was handed down by angels with a man acting as a go-between. But a go-between is not needed when only one person is involved and God is one. So that's our basic scripture for today. <clears throat> so. We're going to ask a couple of really significant questions here. The first one is, what is implied by the idea that the law was added? Was there ever a time when the law did not exist? This passage, of course, focuses on the story of Abraham and God's promise to him. So we would want to know, did the law exist before Abraham's day? And if so, of course, in what form? And did Abraham have the law in some form? That word that is translated into the English as added, <coughs> could it be s translated as stated? No, I don't think so. Well, yeah, I mean, isn't, isn't the way the universe runs based upon laws? Well, and there are verses in the Bible that suggest that the law is based on God's character. Okay. So that's one of the questions we're going to ask. If the law was based on God's character. He's been around a long time. So, but what was if it was added? Was it added at that time, or was it was the law really always there? Is it the, a law you don't murder and you don't steal and so on and so forth? Is that the way the creation and the and, and the universe is meant to run, or was it? Uh, well, we're going along here and we're stumbling and bumbling. And now we got to bring up some yeah. some news. It's not an arbitrary uh, imposition. Well, no. On the other hand, we, know, we must remember what it says in Mark 2, 27 and 28. The law was made for man. Right. Human beings. See, it's not, it's not males, it's human beings. Yeah. And there should be a couple of things that make that obvious. The first is, we live on this planet. And if there's going to be a seventh day Sabbath, that's specific to this planet. But how about, the, about other places in the universe? They don't have other gods. No. No, so, no, so, that's so true. That, so that one, it, it wasn't well, uh, anything new 
when Paul was talking about it, it was already in existence. But we also have one of our major commandments. The seventh commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. They didn't Well, have. the angels can't commit adultery, <laughs> even if they wanted to, as far as we know. But they could, if, if you broaden the idea of adultery to have an allegiance to somebody else, yes. like, like, like they did with Lucifer, or like the children of Israel did with going after other nations or other gods, mm -hmm. so, you know. <laughs> Spiritual adultery. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what, what is implied by Genesis 26, 5? Um, and let me just show you what it says in my version here. Genesis 26, 5, I will bless you because Abraham obeyed me and kept all my laws and commands. Doesn't that suggest that Abraham was keeping the commandments? Mm -hmm. And it very specifically in, in some of the more traditional translations, kept my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. If you look at the a Revised Standard Version, the King James, and so forth. I mean, doesn't that suggest that Abraham was keeping a law? He maybe even, did he have the Ten Commandments? Indeed, because the Sabbath was instituted at the end of creation, the seventh day, mm -hmm. at the end of the six days of creation, so we know that the Ten Commandments were already established from the beginning of creation. Well, but, I, I think the, <coughs> the truth of the law has always been that the way it's been expressed as it came down to Mount, from Mount Sinai is a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's still speaking about the truth that the law brings, but that was the first time it was expressed that way. And even the angels were, it's, were surprised that it could be expressed such a way that it was, according to Ellen okay. White. Okay, yeah. But if, if the problem of evil began in, in heaven, where, we, where I believe, and most of us do, um, they started looking, looking to Lucifer, listening to his uh, uh, misrepresentations and deceptions, and they wanted to, they wanted to be like that. They wanted to, co they coveted after something. This idea of coveting, uh, it's, it's, it, it's actually, yeah. you said before, it's really kind of the basis of everything, the, the, the motivation of greed, so. So what, we're, what we seem to be saying, if I, if I understand you, and what I, I would tend to agree with this, the basic principles of the law have been there. That's the point I'm trying to The make. stating of the law in this particular form, as far as we know, was first expressed at Mount Sinai. And for some reason, I had it, I, I, where it said added, I wrote equals and stated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I got it, but yeah. maybe our study yeah. in the well, past. Well, there's probably some <laughs> version that says that, and, and that may be true. Even though it was not stated until Sinai that we have written down, we have clear indications like this in Genesis 26, 5, that there was law before. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath was clearly around before, including um, I think you're probably going to get into it, that manna didn't fall on the Sabbath yeah. before Mount Sinai. If, you, nope. if, if it's a law of human nature that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire, this, the law, it was a law in, in heaven mm -hmm. that they, they, they wandered after the deceiver, uh, Lucifer, and they became, and third of them uh, bought the line, and, and uh, the result has been what we've experienced or observed over the last 6,000 years. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to notice a few verses, uh, and, and, and I'm going to read these briefly. They're all found in Genesis. We're going to start with Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and I want you to notice who's doing the talking and what are they saying. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home, and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. Who's doing the promising? God is doing the promising. It Abraham's did, did, not doing anything. Abraham's not doing anything? Is what kind of a covenant he's of that? Of God? He's what? listening, he's responding. Yeah. Yeah. He's listening not. and responding, huh? Well, look at Genesis 15, verse 18 now. Then and there the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He said, I promise to give your descendants all this land from the border of Egypt to the river Euphrates. And so forth, going on, including all these other lands. Uh, who's doing the promising again? God. God. Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said, so shall your descendants be. Yeah. And it was reckoned with uh, Abraham as righteousness. 
But look at Genesis 18, I'm sorry, 17, the first eight verses of Genesis 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. Now that's almost suggesting some kind of a part, something on Abraham's part, right? I will make my covenant with you and give my, you many descendants. Abram bowed down with his face touching the ground, and God said, I make this covenant with you. I promise. Now God, look who's doing the promising. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. Because I am making you the ancestor of many nations, I will give you many descendants, and some of them will be kings. You will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your ancestors, your descendants, I'm sorry. I will give to you and to your descendants this land in which you are now a foreigner. The whole land of Canaan will belong to your descendants forever, and I will be their God. Again, who's doing the promising? God. God. All the promises are being made by God. Well, do you have any evidence that Abraham was making any promises at all? Abraham didn't promise anything, well, did, did he? Did he have a purpose? Hmm? Did he have a purpose? Did he have a part in this? What about this was, I mean, how would we feel? Like, we would say, would we turn to God if, if he spoke to us like this and said, I'm sorry, I don't want that, I, and I want to do part of the promising here. Would you do that? Well, yeah, but that isn't my question. <laughs> I mean, can he just disappear, Abraham disappear, and all this stuff will happen? Well, no. <laughs> no. I mean, obviously, so there's, the problem is there's, to Abraham. There's some stuff there that's being done, um, like faith. Mm -hmm. You have to have faith. I mean, when you, if you build a house, it doesn't mean that you're going to actually get it done or you're going to get it finished. You know, some something's got to um, make that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, he just guaranteed that it's going to happen. Well, it's interesting, and I, we, we're, this is not our main subject for today, but if you go to Genesis, I'm sorry, go to Exodus 19, verse 8, or to Exodus 24, verses 3 and 7, what is sometimes referred to in the Bible as the Old Covenant, who did all the promising? The people. The people. God, all that the Lord has said, we will do. All that the Lord has said, we will do, right? Three times they said that, and God says, I'm not sure you understood me. Let me say it again. So he gives the commandments again. He reviews the whole thing. He writes it down. Then he reads it to them. Everything that the Lord has said, we will do. That's called the Old Covenant. But there's one that comes along quite a long time later in, in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, that's called the New Covenant. What's different about the New Covenant? Same thing. What? Basically the same covenant. Who's He's restating it. God's restating it again. Who's doing the promising? God. God. I think it comes back to God saying yeah. He will write the law upon our hearts. So what have we seen here? We've seen that the, the earliest covenant, the one made by Abraham, was God doing all the promising. What we call the old covenant was the people doing the promising and it didn't work. Then the one we call the new covenant, who's doing all the promising again? God. 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 So when God does the promising, it works. When we do the promising, what happens? doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's an important point, I think. So, what's the difference, and this is one of the questions that comes up in reading Galatians, what's the difference between a covenant and a will? Another word for covenant is agreement. What would be the difference between an agreement and a will? One has to do with death. Okay, well, I, it doesn't take kind of effect until death, but uh, a will, if somebody, if I will something to him, he's entitled to it only because I chose to give it to him. Yeah. And uh, this is... But not until you die. Until I die. Yeah. It does, it does yeah. not affect you. But it, again, you notice what's happening here. One person is making the decision. And he says, I will do, the, or I mean, I, my, I, my estate will do thus and so when I die. Unless I make it conditional. Yeah, and unless we, you make which, it conditional. In general, it, it's... Our, our laws allow for that. But in general, Will says, I'm going to do this. I want my, my son to have half of my property. I want my daughter to have the other half, or something like that. Very simple, right? Mm -hmm. Well, but a covenant, what's the difference with that? An agreement. agreement. 
between two people that actively decide between themselves. Exactly. You have to sit down together and you decide, okay, we're going to do this, I'm going to sell you this house for X number of dollars, and so forth. That's an agreement or a covenant. So as you read the verses in, in Genesis, would you describe that as a will or as a covenant? The ones we read. Well, it didn't depend upon anyone's a death. Covenant. So it was a covenant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Closer to well, no, 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 no. Who is, how many people were promising? Only one was promising. Only one. So it's really more like a will, isn't it? Well, what do we say? The promisings and the threatenings are alike conditional? Yes. Uh, I've heard that before. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to go, the Bible makes quite a big point of that, but if you go to the next couple of verses, look at Genesis 17, starting with verse 9. God said to Abraham, you also must agree to keep the covenant with me, both you and your descendants in future generations. You and your descendants must all agree to circumcise every male among you. From now on, you must circumcise every baby boy. So this is now a covenant, right? Because you agreed. That's what it looks like. And, um, and doing the circumcision is a sign of the agreement? between the person? That's what God says here. Yeah. Okay. Now, think about this. What did Abraham do that God asked him to do? Uh, he leave. left his land. Yeah, he left the Chaldees, he went to Haran, he stayed there for a period of time, then he left Haran, he went to Canaan, right? I mean, that's just, that's the beginning of the story. It goes on from there, but that's at least the beginning of the story, isn't it? And he yeah. left because... God told him to? Apparently. Um, wasn't there something he promised if he leaves? We don't know. We don't have very much details about exactly what he promised, but it apparently so. It wasn't anything so, yeah. about the, the promised land? Well, in Abraham's life, as far as we know, he never actually owned any land toward the end. Well, he, he actually bought a piece of property so he could bury his wife. That's what he owned. But he, he left kind of in the, um, the realm of a faith. Mm -hmm. He was, in faith he was leaving because the Lord told him that there would be something better coming out of it if he leaves. So now here's the question. If God makes a promise to Abraham and 430 years later he speaks to the children of Israel and gives the Ten Commandments that we have written on the tables of stone, do those Ten Commandments written 430 years later modify in any way the covenant that he made with Abraham 430 years before. If, say that again. The, the commandments given 430 years later, do they modify or change the promise made 430 years earlier? Legally, no. Right? I mean, if someone makes an agreement, it's signed and sealed, it's done, someone comes along several hundred years later, well, I don't like that, I want to change it. No, you can't. You weren't there. The people who were there, they made the agreement. It's done, finished, right? Well, if they changed it, it would be a different covenant. Yeah. So if you're going to stick with the same one, mm -hmm. you're going to have a reason to go to a different one, but right. there was no reason you had to stay yeah. with that one. Well, that covenant is mentioned many times in the Bible. Genesis 13, 15, 17, 8, Romans 4, 13, Galatians 3, 29, Isaiah 46, 11, and Hebrews 6, 18. So the Bible... Bible writers, they, they thought this was pretty important. Ellen White has these, these comments. Christ came to our world to represent the character of God's, uh, God as it is represented in His holy law. For His law is a transcript of His character. Christ was both the law and the gospel. So that's, that was something we mentioned earlier, suggesting that the law was some kind of transcript of God's character. Now, is that eternal or is that not eternal? Well, it depends if it, in the first law actually reflected the character or not. If it did, well, then it will always be that way. Okay. So are you questioning whether this statement is true? I mean, um, if it, the statement says it did reflect the character of God. Okay, but... It, there could be something else that could reflect the character of God even clearer than the law. Potentially, yeah. 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 
In the book Mount of Blessing, page 109, Ellen White suggests that it came to the angels as something unthought of, that there even could be a law. Why would you make that kind of statement? Because they, probably because they, they did what was right and they understood that it was right. Um, the law was given to people to show them that they were doing something wrong. And so they would probably wouldn't have needed it, would they have, if they were doing it right well, the first time? Paul says way over in Timothy, I think it's Second Timothy, at first, first Timothy, I believe, he says the law is for lawbreakers. If you're not breaking the law, the law doesn't affect you in any way, right? If you just naturally do everything you're supposed to do, you don't have to worry about the law unless somebody's, you know. Maybe that's all they've ever known. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said in Jeremiah, he's going to rewrite it on your on your heart. Yeah. That's where you do your thinking. It, it becomes second nature, is what it's referring to. So the the law, we we just stated at the beginning that the law has always been around in truth, but the expression of it was put together, which was different than before. Because of transgression, it says in Romans three nineteen. You don't need to make a, you don't need to express the law verbally if everybody's doing the right thing. So, yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> Ellen White says in a number of places. I'm just going to read one of them. Some very interesting words. Um, look at these this passage here. As soon as I can get to the right spot. <clears throat> When I, had little yes, kids, when I had little kids, we, you know, said you can't put your finger in the light socket, in the mm -hmm. electric socket. Or even, or even in the, the, the sockets coming out of the wall, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't even think to do something like that, but my kid might. So we had to make a law, a rule. Mm -hmm. For their own good, for, for their, their protection. protection. Yeah. yeah. Until they understood. Yeah. Well, here's the statement I find very interesting. Uh, Ellen White first stated this, I believe, in 1857, but this is the version found in Patriarchs and Prophets and written in 1890. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, did Adam have a law? Yes. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. Was circumcision added? Yes. It was, right? Isn't that, that what that says? Mm -hmm. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant, the agreement, of which circumcision was a sign, there would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They didn't get the message of what the covenant of circumcision was supposed to mean, and that's why they ended up in slavery. Um, they would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tables of stone. Did the law ne need to be added? It needed to be yeah. stated to those that who, because of lawlessness. Yeah. And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses, which we sometimes refer to as a ceremonial law. So it sounds like we failed, God gives something more. We fail, God gives something more. We fail, we give, God gives something more, right? Yeah. And the law was about the fourth iteration of that. <laughs> yeah. Ex explain to me uh, where she says if, if um, Adam would have kept the law as given to him after he sinned, Mm -hmm. Where in the Bible was that given to him? I mean, wh where would you where would you think that she would not tell in scripture. me? It's not in Scripture. Not not stated in so many words. No. So um, what is she saying? Is she saying that these words that came down from Mount Sinai was actually given to um, Adam? Well, what she seems to be implying, as I read it, is that there was some form of law that God gave to Adam. 
And we don't know what the form of that law was. It wasn't until the form of the law that we have, that we still have preserved for us today, was the one given from Sinai. It, it, could, could given just mean understood? Could be. So the problem, there wouldn't necessarily have to be something written down, a document given to Adam and say, hey, read this. No. It could be an understood thing that maybe he was taught mm -hmm. after it happened. God didn't stop teaching the, the, the people before the flood or stop, stop teaching Adam and Eve and those people just because uh, they threw them out of the garden. He didn't just no. abandon them. I mean, that, that would be contrary to the way he runs his universe. Well, I'm just kind of wondering um, what he had before he sinned. Yeah. So, well, because, well, he had directions because he said... He had at least this much directions. Don't eat of that tree. So that's, and don't leave that's each the extent other. of it. And don't leave each other. I doubt that Adam and Eve had rules that said, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal. But he, they probably had laws that said, love each other, love God. And something you can't command and, and, and force to happen. Because by love, you can't force uh, right. love. It, I think it came automatically just because heaven was established in love mm -hmm. and God created Adam and Eve to be perfect which is love with his character so automatically just like the angels did not know that there was a law until sin broke out um, Adam and Eve automatically knew there was a law to keep them in check basically they loved God so much that to them there was no law it, mm -hmm. it was their delight uh, to please God and to be with Him, so... Well, I suppose if, if Adam did something wrong, at that point he'd know there would be a law because you couldn't do anything wrong unless you broke something, so... Okay, now, let's get <laughs> more specifically into Galatians because that's what we're here to study. If God's plan of salvation is based on justification alone, as many of our Christian friends believe, and has nothing to do with observance of law, why was the giving of a law necessary? It was for their protection. Because how would we know that this stuff is wrong if it wasn't declared to us? And of course, the people, even the ones who felt like the law was somehow necessary, they would say, well, but it had a temporary application. It was given at Mount Sinai, it, the, the verse uh, 3, well, especially Galatians 3.19 seems to suggest that after Christ's death, it has no more application, right? Well, Paul mentions he would not know the meaning of lust mm -hmm. had that commandment of thou shalt not commit adultery mm -hmm. be within the ten, one of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. He's, basically, it's like a mirror that reflects what sin is. Mm -hmm. It points it out. Yeah. Go, go back to the, your word justification. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Is it, is it something that's you're justified mm -hmm. because you look into it and you, you um, tear it apart and you say, okay, everything's working fine, or is it justification because I pronounce you justified? I mean, well, what that's, are you talking about? That's one of the questions, yes, because obviously they're very different understandings of the word justification. Use the, a simple the, word to say just to mean justification. The, the word justification is a translation of the Greek word dikaiao, which means to set right or to put right. So that's a simple translation. Yeah. A wonderful, go ahead, I'm sorry. A wonderful chapter to look up is Isaiah 56, mm -hmm. which speaks about, and this does away with the fact that the Sabbath was given to the Old Testament believers because in Isaiah 56 it's a whole chapter speaking about who the Sabbath was given to and that there's nobody who is to say that it's meant for the Jews and the Jews alone but that anybody who joins himself to the Lord is to keep and hollow the Sabbath day and to keep it holy anybody that joins himself to the Lord so it's stating that Sabbath was for the Old Testament Jews and not for the latest or the newest Christians. The fact that this whole chapter, Isaiah 56, is dedicated to saying who the Sabbath was meant for does away with 
that it was just meant for the Jews? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's just review what happened there at Sinai. There was this black cloud that came down on the mountain. There apparently was fire spreading out. I don't know exactly how. Lightning probably. There was a great earthquake. The mountain shook. The children of Israel were scared to death. They stood off at a distance. What do you think God was trying to do there? He was trying to show his power, that he was powerful, more powerful than the gods of Egypt. Would you, he was trying to get their attention. Yes. Would you be comfortable saying, let me get close to this God? No. No. Probably not. Well, wasn't that kind of the image of God to them was pure power? Mm -hmm. the, the biggest God there is is the most is the God that shakes the things up yeah. the most. So and, and, he's and just the, answering, look, I can do that too. So, yeah, well, I mean, and this is one of the things that really set the, the Jewish God apart from all the others. I mean, this God actually does something. You don't, he just doesn't sit there and you nail him down to the floor for fear he'll fall over. You know, you, he actually does things. It's amazing. A God actually does things? Amazing. Well, the question is, how do you explain the difference between that behavior there and 1,500 years later, what happened with Jesus Christ? And here's another quotation from Ellen White. It's found, from volume, found in Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 422. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. They loved to climb upon his lap and to kiss that pensive face benignant with love. Now here he is speaking, speaking to a whole crowd, and the kids are climbing up on his lap and giving him a kiss. I mean, what does that say about God? Very loving. W why is there this incredible discrepancy between Sinai and, and, and this? Because I think if Jesus showed up to those people then, they would never recognize him. Never, Back ever, at Sinai. ever. Yeah. Uh, there, this is the beginning of a process. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the point. It's just, like, it's just like having the goal brought up at the beginning. There's <laughs> it just can't happen. I see. Well, Abraham had a number of fairly intimate and, and open conversations with God. You remember sometime, one time when God appeared on the road, just walking down the road, and Abraham rushed out and said, Come on in, have something to eat. He didn't know who he was talking to. Turns out it was God and two angels, you know. And earlier, he'd come to Abraham in a vision and so forth. Do you think that prepared, that, that kind of common sort of interaction, do you think that was common in the life of Abraham? As far as, as, far as the coming up to God? Well, I mean, the point is, when we come to Genesis 22, God appears to him in the middle of the night and says, take your son out to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Well, you know, I would think that you'd want to know God pretty well and be sure that it was His voice speaking before you do that. I don't Definitely. think that was just the third encounter. No. We talked about two before. Yeah. I, it was a string of encounters yes. and God knew, uh, Abraham knew God personally very well. Well, what's, what's with this encounter business? I mean, have encounter? you had any encounters like that? No. Well, would, if... Not that I know of. Not that you know of, right? But um, if the word came to you that you were to do something as extraordinary as that, would you do it? I don't know. I've had several encounters reading the Bible. Lots of God's, those kind God of encounters. God speaks to me many times. I speak to Him in prayer, but I but haven't heard saying, His voice. You're saying that um, we had the Bible. He, uh, Abraham, had an encounter. Yes. Okay. Well. Okay, that makes sense. Well, the major question here in Galatians 3 is, what was the purpose of the law? To bring us to Christ, and what is it, until Christ came? If you had been God, trying to establish this group of slaves, trying to make a new nation out of them, and you're going to set up a set of laws that's going to be the basis for all of their future lives, hopefully, which one of the Ten Commandments would you want to leave out? Would you want to say it's okay to kill, commit adultery, lie, steal? Well, I think I could take out the 11th. 
the 11th commandment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> so, it's interesting to notice that our Christian friends want to keep nine of the Ten Commandments, but they're not comfortable with what we call the Fourth Commandment or the Sabbath Commandment. Why, why do you suppose that is? Seems a bit pick, pick and choose which one you feel like keeping. Is that, is that what God intended? I don't think so. You don't think so? Well, there is something weird about the Fourth Commandment. It seems a little bit arbitrary. Okay. The other ones, you can probably trace some sort of cataclysmic effect coming back to you from on the other ones. But worshiping on a certain day? And that's why it's a test. Well, what about of obedience? Are, are we arbitrary test of obedience? I'm are we not sure about that? Are we <laughs> obeying simply because all the other ones that we would break uh, have severe consequences attached? Whereas, if we're keeping the Sabbath day, there's no immediate punishment for that. It's interesting that if you if you read on through Leviticus and Numbers, there is a death decree connected to the breaking of every one of this Ten Commandments except the Tenth. Not the Fourth, the Tenth. And why is that? Because it goes on in your head. Yeah, you can't tell for sure when someone's breaking the Tenth Commandment. Only God can. <coughs> and I can't numbers, tell. numbers 15, 30, and 31, there was a guy out picking up sticks on the Sabbath, and they said, what are we supposed to do with this guy? And God says, take him out and stone him. Then people would worship out of fear because they don't want to die. Well, there, and here, here's the big question. There are two kinds of laws that we know about. Laws such as the laws of physics and chemistry and biology are called descriptive laws. For example, the law of gravity, we don't, we don't have the option of changing that, do we? We can't go to Congress and say, we'd like to change the law of gravity, right? Can't do it. It's there. And it's always, as far as we know, it's always functioning. Then there are other, another kind of law called proscriptive laws, and those are the kind of laws that Congress passes or the state legislature passes or whatever like this, like which side of the road we're supposed to drive on or how fast the speed limit should be or how much taxes we should pay. Those are arbitrary laws so, uh, decided upon by some group of human beings, right? Now, the question is, which of those two, two types of laws describe the Ten Commandments? Are they descriptive laws, or are they proscriptive laws? Descriptive. You think so? Except for well, they describe how, you will, how a person will conduct themselves if they are live in harmony with the Creator. In fact, if, if you happen to have Young's literal translation of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, I believe it says, Thou dost not murder. Mm -hmm. It's looking forward. If you live in harmony with the Creator and the, the way that things are meant to run, you won't be out there murdering. Yeah. You won't be stealing. You won't be doing other, other things. And part of the and so then he the Sabbath. It's a time to do some more learning because if it's a law of human nature that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire, you got to spend some time with the teacher. Mm -hmm. Well, does so, understanding the true nature of the law help us develop a better un, better relationship with God Himself? If you understand that these laws are actually descriptions of the way things are supposed to work, does that change your attitude toward God as opposed to a God who says, here are my rules and you better keep them? If you realize that you're self, born self-centered and mm -hmm. self-centered is not the way things are meant to be, <laughs> the, the, the universal economy, the universal system will not work if everybody is self-centered. And the ultimate example of other centeredness was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he was the, all, the only messenger that was also the message. Mm -hmm. So I would say it would because then we can understand him better. This, these laws or these guidelines, I would rather refer to them that way. It that, just shows how much he wants to, he wants to, he's a God of order. He wants to keep order and it helps me understand his character more. Okay. And what what did probably we have? Don't work, don't do any work on the seventh day. What what did he say? I want you to work every day, all seven days, but I want another eight hours. You can't sleep. 
but you got to worship me on those on those other. It's, it's mm. Some some of, that would be really be arbitrary. He just says don't work. Mm -hmm. Okay, remember and don't work. But uh, I, was, I was trying to get to your question about proscriptive and mm -hmm. descriptive. Uh, how are you going to attach that to this question here? I'm asking if 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 it if the if it uh, descriptive laws. If they, in fact, are descriptive laws. Descriptives are observed laws that you, you, you don't make them up. You just find out that they're there. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the other one is just to say, well, I think it organizes real nice if you do it this way, so let's make this <coughs> law. Okay, right. so you're, you're asking if the Ten Commandments, which one of those uh, is the Ten Commandments? <coughs> now, I would say probably nine of them are the fourth is a looks like a dis descriptive, not a descriptive, post but a postscriptive. Yeah. Well, here's the question: Do people live happier, healthier, holier lives if they observe the Seventh Day Sabbath? I've seen Can a lot of people so? observe the Seventh Day and they don't live <laughs> healthier right, now. Right. Not necessarily. And I've seen some people uh, worship on the first day and they're much better off than those other people. Okay. So, I, but, well, but potentially you minute. might be. Before you go too far with that one, the people who are, quote, observing the seventh day, and let's take the classic example, it would be the Pharisees from the New Testament times. Mm -hmm. You think they were really keeping the seventh day Sabbath? No. Not in their heart. So they don't qualify. And your friends who are keeping the seventh day Sabbath are not really. Obviously, if you don't keep the law the way it's supposed to be kept, you're not going to get the benefit, are you? Well, the seventh, if you keep the seventh day, of course, you're, you're connected with everybody in the Bible. Going back, there's, there's an obvious thing but, there. But if, you, if you keep it correctly, that's the question. You don't get the blessing if you just arbitrarily keep it like a bunch of Pharisees. So what's correct and not correct? Are you referring to... It? Mm. Well, obviously, that would take a, quite a bit of time for us to discuss that, and that's not really our subject for today. But, and it's an, a very important question. So each one of us needs to look at the Bible and say, how did God intend for us to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath? Very good question. I well, have an issue with uh, using the word arbitrary with God myself, just for the fact that in Exodus 20, in the very heart of the Ten Commandments, it says, if you love me, mm -hmm. keep my commandments. So it's obedience, a response of obedience, because we love him for his great sacrifice and for his promises that he's given us mm -hmm. to hang on to. And then Hebrews chapter 4 goes into detail about keeping the Sabbath holy again uh, by the same writer, Paul, who did Galatians. Um, and again, God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And it comes down to uh, belief in him. Here in Hebrews um, chapter 4, it says, let us therefore strive to enter into that rest, mm -hmm. lest we enter into the same example of unbelief as the Israelites did that were destroyed in the desert. Yeah. Um, well, I think it you know, it's not arbitrary at all. It's just like the angels. They love him. They keep his commandments. They didn't know there was a law. Okay, I'm, I'm going to throw you a curve now. Acts 16.31 talks about the Philippian jailer. And right after the earthquake, you know, Paul and Silas said, Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. We're all here. And he comes in with his light and he says, Wow, you're all here even though all the, all the doors are open and so forth. Yeah, we're all here. And something led him to say, and we don't know whether it was the, song, the songs that Paul and Silas were singing or how he got this idea, but he says, what must I do to be saved? And what was Paul's response? Believe. Lord Jesus. Believe or trust or have faith. This verse says the only requirement for salvation is faith. Now I'm going to say, okay, we've been talking about the law for quite a while now. What does that have to do with faith? The law? Mm-hmm. Well, you have to have faith in something. Don't you have faith in God? I have in faith God? in God. 
Yeah, but wasn't the law, didn't the, isn't the law the express expression of his character? So aren't you having faith in God that has that character of the law? Yeah. Well, then how are you going to have faith if, if you don't have faith in that kind of a God? So you're saying if we have a relationship with God, we have a relationship with the law. Well, because the law is an expression of his character, yeah. so okay. you are. Amen. Well, does, does faith uh, do away with the law then? Well, it seems to say that we're... That's a good question because it says in the New Testament that we're not under the Old Covenant anymore. Yeah. Romans 3.31, after discussing a lot about faith, Paul says in these words, Does this mean that by this faith we do away with the law? No, not at all. Instead, we uphold the law. So, Paul didn't think so. And there's a bunch of other verses we could read if we had time. Romans 7.7, 7, 7.12, 7, 8.3, and Matthew 5, 17 to 19. There are many circumstances under which following God's commandments literally preserves us from destruction. And this comment from the SDA Bible Commentary, Moreover, genuine faith implies in itself an unreserved willingness to fulfill the will of God in a life of obedience to His law. Real faith, based on wholehearted love for the Savior, can lead only to obedience. Do you agree with that? Yes. And I believe that there is this place where Jesus speaks on the law and he says, he came not to abolish, but to fulfill the law, number one. Matthew 5, 17, mm -hmm. well, 17 and 18. Yeah. And then he states, not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. That includes the book of Revelation, which speaks of the time we believe we're living in now, which is the end time of this earth's history. So if we believe that, and Jesus says, not one jot nor one tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled, I think that would include the Sabbath day, you know, the seventh day of worship. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose James calls the law the royal law of liberty? When you keep the law, the Ten Commandments, you have liberty from sin. Sin is a transgression of the law. Maybe you are freed from the bondage that you are susceptible and vulnerable to when you're not. Did, did Paul, in speaking of the law here in Galatians 3, specifically say which law he was talking about? No. No. We know from other parts of Scripture, other parts of the New Testament, that in, in, in Paul's day, well, in Jesus' day, they sometimes use law to refer to the Ten Commandments. They sometimes use law to refer to the whole, all, all the writings of Moses. And they sometimes used the word law even to refer to the whole, what we would call the whole Old Testament. So how do we know which law they're talking about, the ceremony? That's of the, the next big question. How do we know which law they were talking about? Well, the one that, the part that doesn't lose anything is going to be one part, right? And the one that loses things mm -hmm. will be the other part. Uh, if, you, if you look through um, Paul's writings, he's got some specific laws that he says aren't important anymore. Um, you know, and that would probably be the Jewish law, the, the s stuff given by Moses, the ceremonial law mm -hmm. type of things. And then you've got the type of a law that's the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Well, here was a, here's a suggestion by one commentator. The law acts as a magnifying glass. That device does not actually increase the number of dirty spots that defile a garment, but makes them stand out more clearly and reveals more, many more of them than one is able to see with the naked eye. So is that how the law works? Well, that's what we said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. The law was given to show our transgression. Okay. And that's exactly what's happening right there. So coming back to the question of which law is being specifically referred to as being added, what should we answer? All law. Can we even? <laughs> 
Allah. Can we oh. even separate them, moral law and ceremonial law? Is that okay? Some people think they can. We need to understand a little of the historical context and we're, we're running low on time here, so let me just go through this very quickly. When Alexander the Great conquered the world, he had the idea that to make everybody civilized, they should act like Greeks, speak like Greeks, think like Greeks, etc. We're the civilized people. The rest of you are a bunch of barbarians, okay? And so he went around, he reorganized, I mean, he just literally rebuilt cities to make them look like Greek cities and on and on. He wanted everybody to speak Greek, etc. And this became quite a problem in the days of Jesus, which of course was many years later, but there was still a lot of pressure to Hellenize, that's the technical word we use for this effort to make everybody live like Greeks. Among the Jews, there were very different approaches to this. The Essenes be, were so upset by this effort to try to get everybody to be like Greeks that they moved away from society and lived down by the Dead Sea. They just separated themselves completely. They didn't want to have anything to do with the rest of the world. The Sadducees enriched themselves by cooperating with the Romans. They didn't want it sort of be obvious that they were cooperating, but they did behind this, sort of behind the scenes. The Pharisees, by contrast, felt that it was their job to preserve Judaism. You know, the only way we're going to get ahead in this world is do exactly what God says, and they multiplied rules for, for observing, observation, especially for things like keeping the Sabbath. And so it had become a real burden to someone who wanted to become a Jew and later people who wanted to be Christians. Now these Judaizing Christians that are here in Galatia are trying to tell the, the Christians there, you've got to follow all these Jewish rules if you're going to be a, before you can be a Christian. So now I have a question for you. Who's the most famous Pharisee of all time? Paul. Paul. We usually don't think of him like that, do we? But he is. He's the most famous. Can you name any other Pharisees? Yeah, Nathaniel. Wasn't he a Pharisee? Okay. Simon the, yeah. the Simon. former leper. Uh, Simon the former leper. Bo Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. And who was he associated closely with? Nicodemus. They were all Pharisees. Nicodemus. Who became? That was the one that was really meant to say. Yeah. 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 Well, so if you think about Paul, he said, if we read, took time to read the verses, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, wasn't he? A very strict follower of the, of the law, according to the Pharisaical codes. So if there was anyone who could speak about the pitfalls of living that kind of life, Paul should have been able to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, God, who regarded Abraham as his friend, did not believe it was necessary to approach him with a black cloud, thunder, lightning, and fire, although he did what? He knocked him over, knocked him down on the road to Damascus, didn't he? But the children of Israel needed that, apparently. Well, our Christian friends feel like that when Christ died on the cross, it, it sort of did away with the law. We don't need the law anymore. That certainly conflicts with much of what Paul says in the book of Romans. So what are they trying to say by suggesting that the law is done away with by the death of Christ? Is it okay now to commit adultery, kill, steal, lie, etc.? No, because when you're in Christ, you don't want to do that those things. And now you're back to the descriptive laws, aren't you? If, it, if you are really wanting to be like Jesus Christ and you end up naturally doing what's right, that's a descriptive kind of an arrangement, isn't it? It means you're, you just do it naturally, right? Might I raise a question? Sure. Um, they have this argument that the first Christians were, you know, Jews, Jews after Christ's death. I go back to Adam and Eve who were the first Christians in the sense that they were given the Sabbath day to keep holy and they had to display, their, take Cain and Abel for instance. Uh, Cain brought a disobedient sacrifice, Abel brought an obedient one, which one was accepted. And mm -hmm. when 
Abel's sacrifice was accepted, that displayed a belief in the future Christ, mm -hmm. which makes him, in my mind, a Christian. Okay. We like to think that. Some of our friends, the Jewish friends, would not be so ready to accept that idea. <laughs> but yeah, we like to think that. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, in light of that general principle you're trying to suggest, what about the verses in the Bible that seem to suggest that love is the fulfilling of all law? So we, all we need really is one law, right? You have to love. Jesus himself said, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? But the commandments describe all of those. Those are summing it up yeah. pretty much. But I see here it's kind of hard because in Galatians it says um, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Mm -hmm. And um, it was our schoolmaster. Well, in Moses' final presentation to the children of Israel, he seemed to suggest that if you could keep the law, you could be saved by it, by doing so. Is that true or not true? We'll never know because no one could do it. <laughs> and that's the problem, isn't it? The problem isn't there's something wrong with the law. The problem is that we fail to keep it, right? So the failure is on our part. We shouldn't blame the law. Now, some people would like to modify the law to make it easier so that maybe we could keep it. With and Christ, think, with Christ, it keeps us going back to Christ. Mm -hmm. With Him, all things are possible. So now, if Abraham is our great example of faith, and again, we're just about out of time, but if great, Abraham is our great example of faith, how many churches did he attend? Did he have the Bible? Did he have a pastor? No. How did he develop that relationship with God, that great faith relationship with God? close personal relationship. A close personal relationship. Well, those of us who believe in what we call the Great Controversy Trust Healing Model of the Plan of Salvation, the life and death of Jesus Christ has given us a clear picture of the kind of person God is and the devastating results of sin. God's law spells out the nature of sin in more detail. It is only by studying and meditating on the life of Christ and by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to transform us into His nature that we have any chance of becoming more like Him so that we can enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that that's what the whole picture is supposed to say to us. See you again next week.